Chapter 9, The Secret Recipe Where last we left off in the story of John Jones, he had arguably hit the peak of his MMA career. John had tied up the loose ends of the UFC 151 debacle by demolishing Chael Sonnen in under a round. He then went on to have the toughest fight of his career up to that point when Alexander Gustafsson dragged him into an unexpected five-round war. Amidst a call for a rematch with Gustafsson, John put on a one-sided beatdown of Glover Teixeira. Jones and Gustafsson were scheduled to fight for the title once again, but a series of injuries saw the mauler replaced by Daniel Cormier. It was the culmination of a rivalry that had been quietly brewing for several years. The pairing led to multiple incidents that exposed an underlying duplicity of John's character that many fans had suspected since the beginning of his rise through the ranks of MMA. Despite the fiery nature of the pre-fight buildup, the fight between Jones and Cormier was somewhat underwhelming. Nevertheless, John had once again broken records. He had all but cleaned out the light heavyweight division and was beginning to establish a heretofore unparalleled reign of dominance. To hear John say it in the post-fight press conference for UFC 182, things were looking good. Um, you know, my plan is to become the greatest fighter of all time, and, and it, it's so feasible, it's so attainable. All I gotta do is just stay focused and keep believing just the way I believe and, uh, and to keep working. And uh, I do believe 2015 will be the year I solidify it. Then John pissed hot. On January 6th of 2015, just three days after John beat Cormier, it was revealed that he had failed an out-of-competition test for the cocaine metabolite benzoylecanine. Subsequently, John immediately checked himself into a rehab facility. When the news broke, John released a statement to Yahoo Sports through his attorney. Quote, With the support of my family, I have entered into a drug treatment facility. I want to apologize to my fiancé, my children, as well as my mother, father, and brothers for the mistake that I made. I also want to apologize to the UFC, my coaches, my sponsors, and equally important, to my fans. I am taking this treatment program very seriously. Therefore, at this time, my family and I would appreciate privacy." End quote. Shortly afterward, the UFC put out a statement on the incident supporting John's decision to enter a treatment facility to address his recent issues, and that while they were disappointed in the failed test, they applauded him for making his decision. Additionally, Dana White expressed his pride in Jones for making the decision to enter rehab, as well as his confidence that John would emerge from this program like the champion he truly is. This was all well and good, but as more details emerged about John's test failure, they only fueled further questions about what exactly happened. And this is where things already start getting confusing, because honestly, this incident is one of the most puzzling and inexplicable events I've come across in MMA. The first question you may be asking is, if John tested positive before UFC 182, why was he allowed to fight Cormier? After all, athletic commissions have given fighters like Nick Diaz draconian sentences for weed. Why would they let John keep fighting when he pissed hot for the devil's dandruff? Seems pretty hypocritical, right? This is actually the simplest question to answer. The test John popped for was administered on December 4th of 2014. He was actually tested twice, but one sample was quote-unquote, watery. Either way, both tested positive for benzoylecanine. However, the NSAC learned of the failure on December 23rd, still over a week before the fight. So why didn't they call the fight off? Well, aside from the generally questionable ethics of the NSAC, coke isn't a prohibited substance outside of competition. See, the NSAC followed World Anti-Doping Agency guidelines for testing. According to WADA, coke was only banned in competition. At the time, WADA defined in competition as unless provided otherwise in the rules of an international federation or the ruling body of the event in question, in competition means the period commencing 12 hours before a competition in which the athlete is scheduled to participate through the end of such competition and the sample collection process related to such competition. End quote. Since John had failed the test on the 4th of December, a full month out from the fight, it was definitely out of competition so he hadn't broken any rules. Now, the next question you probably have is, if coke isn't banned out of competition, why was John tested for it to begin with? Here's the thing. Nobody fucking knows. Then executive director Bob Bennett said the test was an anomaly and administrative oversight. Where things get even more confusing is that there are conflicting stories about the other out-of-competition tests that John took before the fight, 
In a statement to Kevin Ioli of Yahoo Sports, Commission Chairman Francisco Aguilar said that John was tested again on December 11th or 12th, and that test came back clean for benzoylecanine. Which doesn't make any sense because why would they test him again for coke out of competition if the first time around was administrative oversight or an anomaly? On the other hand, Bob Bennett said that John's next test was on December 18th, which he passed. However, that test was just for out-of-competition drugs such as anabolic steroids, no street drugs, as Bennett explained. Could this all have been some kind of miscommunication or misunderstanding? Sure, but as you'll see, it only gets murkier from here. According to an article by Ariel Helwani, Jones was not notified by the Nevada Athletic Commission of the failed test before the fight, and sources say he was informed by UFC officials on Monday. For their part, the UFC declined to comment on their timeline of events. Dana White did speak about the issue to a degree when he was a guest on Fox Sports 1's America's pregame show. Dana essentially said that because John hadn't failed a test for performance enhancers, they didn't see a reason to stop the fight which Jones had signed a contract for, which makes sense. The decision not to inform Daniel Cormier of the failure, that's a bit more problematic. Dana also spoke on the test failure as it related to John Jones as a person. Quote, I was shocked, obviously, and this is one of those situations where it's so different than if a guy gets busted for performance enhancing drugs. You worry about the person first, you know. You forget about the fighting and the work side of it. You worry about the person, John Jones as a person. He got checked into rehab, they're going to evaluate him, and then we'll go from there. Everything happens for a reason. It's a great thing this happened. It's a great thing this guy made a mistake. Who would have known? We would never know. We'll get him the help that he needs." End quote. As optimistic as Dana's view of John's rehabilitation was, the reality was much different. As it turned out, John proved to be a record breaker in more ways than one when he managed to complete rehab in less than one day. This fact came to light when John's mom was interviewed on local news and revealed that his time in rehab was an overnight stay and he would be attending one of his brother's football games. Sunburned Michael Chiklis was quick to counter this claim in an interview with the Boston Herald, saying, When John Jones comes out and does his interview, the truth will come out, and everyone will understand. Or they won't, you know. John is a very polarizing guy. People either love him or they hate him. Either way, the truth will come out soon. End quote. During the interview, Dana defended the UFC's decision to let John fight, despite the fact that John had violated the company's code of conduct by failing a test for an illicit substance. In Dana's own words, You can bust guys, you can find guys, but I can't pull him out of a fight. That thing will be in a lawsuit in 3.5 seconds, and I'll lose. So then we don't have a fight, and I've still got to pay the money. Shortly thereafter, the UFC did end up fining John $25,000 for violating the code of conduct. And Dana was right about another thing. It didn't take long for John to come out with his side of the story. In an exclusive interview with Fox Sports Live, John explained that even before the UFC told him, he expected that he was going to test positive. Unfortunately, the only clip of this interview I can find is a promo on the now-defunct UFC on Fox YouTube channel. But thankfully, I found an archived version of the transcript for the video. It's actually a pretty interesting read because it's probably the closest we've come to John taking responsibility for his actions. Quote, I'm not here to make excuses for what happened. I did it basically at a party, and I think a coward would sit here and come up with this elaborate reason or try to blame something. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to blame my friends. I'm not going to blame pressure or stress or anything. What I will say is I messed up. It wasn't a mistake. I can't call it a mistake because I consciously did it. End quote. During the interview, John also provided some additional context for his controversial one-day rehab stay. According to John, during the brief stay in the recovery facility, he was interviewed by three different doctors who determined that he was healthy enough to receive outpatient care instead of inpatient rehab. John was also keen to explain that he wasn't an addict or even a regular user. He just messed up and got caught. The circumstances surrounding this positive test get even stranger, though, because it wasn't just the Bolivian marching powder that raised red flags among fans and journalists. When John's test results were made public, Many people noted that John's testosterone to epitestosterone levels were abnormally low. The test administered on December 4th showed T to E ratios of 0.29 to 1 and 0.35 to 1 respectively. However, the test administered on December 18th showed a staggeringly low testosterone to epitestosterone level 
of 0.19 to 1. To put things into perspective, an average man has a T to E ratio of 1 to 1. There is some variation based on ethnicity, but the average is basically 1 to 1. At the time, WADA allowed for athletes to have a 4 to 1 TE ratio, and the NSAC allowed for a 6 to 1 ratio. Any way you slice it, John's ratios were extremely low. Even more alarming was John's total testosterone levels. Again, for perspective, the average male has a testosterone level of somewhere between 300 and 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. The tests administered to John on December 4th show that he had testosterone levels of 59 and 180 nanograms per deciliter, respectively, both well below the low end for an average male, let alone an elite athlete in his physical prime. 59 nanograms per deciliter of testosterone is actually so low that it is within the normal range for women. Even the test from December 18th still shows a test level of 490 nanograms per deciliter, and this is combined with the insanely low TE ratio of 0.19 to 1. I'm not an endocrinologist or a PED expert, but from my research, the combination of the extremely low testosterone level with the low TE ratio is a huge red flag for steroid use, as steroids suppress your body's natural production of testosterone. At the time that these abnormally low test results were made public, Several people raised the alarm, specifically Victor Conti, former owner of the infamous Bay Area Laboratory Cooperative, better known as Balco. Conti called John's results highly suspicious and said that John Jones should be on a very short leash and should be randomly tested until they sort out why he has these anomalies. You can say what you want about Conti as a person and his involvement in the Balco scandal, but the guy knows what he's talking about when it comes to PEDs. Following these test results being made public, he and several other experts in the field called for carbon isotope ratio tests to be done on John's urine samples. And wouldn't you know it, the very next day, Bob Bennett, executive director of the Nevada State Athletic Commission, stated that they had already done CIR tests on John's urine samples, and they came back clean. Now, even assuming the NSAC did magically get these tests done in less than a day, or they already had them done before in another weird testing anomaly, but for some reason didn't mention it until after people publicly called for the tests to be done, there was another issue. They didn't test for synthetic testosterone. You know, the thing that would have caused John's levels to be so fucked up in the first place? After this, the whole issue was essentially swept under the rug. The NSAC would announce that all of John's post-fight test results were clean, and following this, the suspicious hormone levels were largely overshadowed by the more comical spectacle of his coke scandal. So at this point, you might be wondering why I've devoted so much time to a couple of test failures that didn't break any rules or result in any punishment beyond a $25,000 fine for violating the code of conduct. For one thing, it's a truly bizarre MMA mystery that really has no good explanations that don't all point towards some kind of cover-up, but also I believe this was a major fork in the road of John's career. The recurring theme that plays out over and over again, specifically in the latter half of John's career, is one of getting in trouble, being let off with a relatively light punishment, not taking any responsibility for his actions, and then being allowed to repeat the cycle all over again. Had John not been let off so lightly, this could have been the moment in his story that changed a lot and sent him down a different path. Imagine for a moment that John's B samples from UFC 182 had been put through more rigorous testing, or had he been subjected to random tests like Victor Conti suggested. Had John's PED use been discovered at this point in time, we might have avoided the disasters of UFC 200 and UFC 214. Think of a timeline where John's win over DC at UFC 180 is known for a failed PED test, instead of bragging that he beat DC's ass after a weekend of coke. More importantly, what if the UFC had taken a more serious approach to their poster boy having his second public substance abuse scandal? Instead of talking about how proud they were of him for checking into one day of rehab, maybe require him to go through more serious treatment, as well as attend therapy for whatever underlying issues he had. I know, I know, independent contractors and all of that, but the meaning of that term is really flexible for the UFC when they want it to be. The worst case scenario here is that nothing would have changed. We would still see all of the same outcomes that we got in our timeline. On the other hand, we might have been able to avoid the worst of the controversies that were about to come.
Once all of the memes died down and MMA fans had generally moved on from the controversies of UFC 182, the focus returned to John's next fight. By this point, Anthony Johnson had already finished Alexander Gustafson in brutal fashion, killing the prospect of a rematch between Gus and Jones, and making a case for himself as number one contender in the process. Rumble, as he is better known by the fans, had spent most of his career struggling to dehydrate his 6'2", well-muscled frame down to the welterweight limit of 175 pounds. Despite displaying lethal knockout power, Rumble had a tendency to be taken down and submitted. He also failed to make weight on multiple occasions. Once so hilariously after moving up to middleweight for a fight against Vitor Belfort, that he missed weight by 11 fucking pounds. Vitor only agreed to fight Johnson based on the stipulation that Rumble wouldn't be over 205 pounds on fight day, which is hilarious when you consider what TRT Vitor was doing at the exact same time. Rumble ended up gassing out in the first round, then got submitted by Belfort, and subsequently cut by the UFC. When he returned to the promotion, he had a crazy fight with Phil Davis, he nuked Little Nog with a forehead punch of doom, and then made Gustafsson headbang like he was in a Swedish black metal band. With the 205 pound division essentially cleared out aside from Rumble, who was coming off an impressive tear through the light heavyweight division, there was really only one fight to make. After the usual period of uncertainty about when the fight would take place, Jones vs. Johnson was scheduled to take place at UFC 187 on May 23rd. The next few months were some of the quietest in John's career. There was no beef with Rumble, who made it clear that he didn't care about John's extracurricular activities. I'm not going out of my way to be nice. I'm human. He's human. You know what I'm saying? We all make mistakes. You know what I'm saying? The world is... The closest we got to any kind of confrontation between them was when they pranked Dana White by staging a fake brawl at the press conference. But this is where I have to disappoint you, because much like my recap of Rumble's MMA career, the UFC's promotion of Jones vs. Johnson was ultimately a waste of time. On the morning of April 26th, rumors began spreading through MMA websites and social media circles that John Jones was out of UFC 187. MMAweekly.com was the first to post a story confirming this rumor. Once their article went public, their source changed their story, saying that John wasn't off the card yet, but had been involved in a car accident. What followed was one of the most tense periods in MMA history, with the stakes rising as every new bit of information came to light. It began with a tweet made by the Albuquerque Police Department, stating that they could not confirm that John Jones had been involved in a hit-and-run traffic accident that morning, and that the investigation was ongoing. The Albuquerque PD soon released a statement officially announcing that they were seeking Jones for questioning in regards to his possible involvement in a hit-and-run accident near the intersection of Wantabo and Southern in southeast Albuquerque early this morning, April 26, 2015. The statement also revealed that a pregnant female in her 20s, who was the driver of a separate car, was taken to a hospital for minor injuries. Officers had attempted to contact John at his residence on Sunday evening, and reached out to his lawyer but were unsuccessful. Shortly thereafter, the UFC released their own statement on the issue, saying that they were aware that the Albuquerque Police Department is interested in speaking to John Jones regarding his possible involvement in a motor vehicle accident, and will reserve further comment until more information is available. More information will become available quite soon. Before the day was over, John had officially been named a suspect by the Albuquerque PD, but the story was only getting started at this point. The following day, MMA Junkie obtained the police report for the hit-and-run incident, which described witness statements of a silver SUV running a red light and crashing into the driver's side of a Honda, which subsequently crashed into a third vehicle. Witnesses, including an off-duty cop who later identified the driver of the silver SUV, stated that the suspect fled his vehicle and ran up a small nearby hill then ran back to his vehicle, grabbed a large handful of cash that he proceeded to shove into his pants before fleeing once again and jumping a fence. The driver of the Honda, who was pregnant, was taken to the hospital because she felt like she was going to pass out. Officers on site then searched the vehicle, where they found a marijuana pipe with marijuana inside of it and paperwork with John's name on it, as well as MMA information. Pro MMA, bro. That's it. Where? Pro MMA, it's right here. Pro MMA. Advising yep. Yep. Are all to the state. Well, he's fucked. Yep, he is. Though not mentioned in the report, you can see from the police body cam footage that there was also a bag of Funyuns and several boxes of condoms. Shitload of condoms. 
Yeah, and then they come. So just to recap, John was rolling through the streets of the ABQ, getting ready to smoke a bowl and eat some Funyuns with his boo-boo wild thing, when he t-boned a pregnant woman. Then he tried to flee, but remembered he had left a bunch of cash in the car. So he ran back and stuffed the money down his pants, like a hobo lining their clothes with newspapers to stay warm in winter, and ran off again, leaving behind his bowl, his pot, as well as multiple crucial documents explicitly identifying him as the driver, and what the officer on scene described as a shitload of condoms. That last detail isn't really relevant, but it is funny. After the woman John hit was taken to the hospital, it was discovered that she had suffered a broken arm in the hit and run, meaning that Jones would be facing felony charges. At this point, the Albuquerque PD officially issued a warrant for John's arrest. After laying low for a while, John turned himself in on the evening of the 27th. By the next day, John was out of the Bernalillo County Metro Detention Center on a $2,500 bond. Later in the newscast. Just a few hours ago, a world famous UFC fighter turned himself into Albuquerque police. Investigators say John Bones Jones hit a pregnant woman's car, then ran off. Action 7 News reporter Laura Terrain was there as Jones left jail tonight. He's a champion UFC fighter. Now, John Bones Jones will be fighting felony charges for leaving the scene of a hit and run accident. John, do you have anything to say? Jones did not say a word as he left Metropolitan Detention Center Monday night. As more and more damning information about the hit and run came to light, people were increasingly calling for the UFC to strip Jones. The situation was so dire that Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta personally flew out to Albuquerque to speak with John and his lawyer. Later that day, the UFC released a statement saying that Jones had been stripped of his belt and that Anthony Johnson would be fighting Daniel Cormier for the light heavyweight title. Quote, UFC announced that it has suspended John Jones indefinitely and stripped him of the light heavyweight title as a result of violations of the organization's athlete code of conduct policy. Jones was recently arrested in Albuquerque, New Mexico on a felony charge of leaving the scene of an accident involving personal injury. As a result of the charge and other violations of the Athlete Code of Conduct policy, the organization believes it is best to allow Jones time to focus on his pending legal matters. UFC feels strongly that its athletes must uphold certain standards both in and out of the octagon. While there is disappointment in the recent charges, the organization remains supportive of Jones as he works through the legal process." End quote. This decision was, and still is, basically unprecedented. No other UFC champion has been stripped of their belt in this manner, a personal or legal issue that took place outside of the octagon. Reactions at the time were mixed. Some people believed that the punishment was justified, given the severity of the crime John was being accused of. Others suggested that the UFC hadn't gone far enough, and John should have been completely cut from the UFC. Then there were the individuals who stated that John was still the rightful champ, regardless of whether he held the belt or not. For his part, John simply addressed the issue with a tweet apologizing to his fans. Quote, Got a lot of soul searching to do. Sorry to everyone I've let down. End quote. While it probably paled in comparison to being stripped of his belt and indefinitely suspended by the UFC, Reebok also terminated their sponsorship with John effective immediately following the hit and run, making this the second major sponsorship he had lost in less than six months. Losing his Reebok sponsorship may have stung a little less than losing a blue chip sponsor like Nike, but it's worth noting that Reebok had just put him in the commercial for their Reebok Z-Pump shoes only a month prior to this accident. It would take John almost a full year before he set foot in the octagon again, but for the time being, John remained in a self-imposed exile. For several months, John largely stayed out of the public eye, with only a few clips of training footage making their way to social media. During John's absence from the sport, Cormier would go on to defeat Rumble in a fight where he was almost knocked out in the first 30 seconds of the first round. But in vintage form, Johnson wilted under pressure and gave his neck up in the third. After claiming the vacant light heavyweight title, Cormier delivered one of the most iconic moments of this intense rivalry. John Jones, get your together, I'm waiting for you! Seemingly, that was what John was trying to do. His day in court would come in late September. In a decision the judge himself described as really lucky for Jones, 
John was only given 18 months of probation and required to give 72 speeches to children as part of his community service. As John left the courtroom, he looked like a man who had been given a new lease on life. Following the hearing, John released a statement through his crisis management PR firm, EAG Sports Management. Quote, With regards to today's decision made by the court, I am very happy to now be able to put this incident behind me. My actions have caused pain and inconvenience in the lives of others, and for that I am truly sorry and I accept full responsibility. I have been working hard during this time away from my sport to grow and mature as a man and to ensure that nothing like this happens again. I have learned a great deal from this situation, and I am determined to emerge a better person because of it. I apologize to those who were affected by my actions in this incident, and I am hopeful that I will be given the opportunity to redeem myself in the eyes of the public, my family, and friends, as well as my supporters. I am not sure what the future holds for me, but I plan to continue to do the work needed to be productive and successful in every aspect of my life." End quote. The UFC also released a statement of their own, saying that they were aware that John Jones reached a plea agreement with authorities in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they will thoroughly review the agreement before discussing Jones' possible reinstatement to return to competition. It would take them less than a month to reinstate him. John expressed his gratitude for being able to practice his sport once again, assuring fans that the best was yet to come. Even DC took the opportunity to congratulate John for backing up his words with actions. During his time away, John took up powerlifting and showed off an impressive body transformation. At least according to his coaches, he was also crushing his court-mandated public speaking appearances, sometimes performing five in one day. For all the world, it seemed as though John was on the right path. In late November, we would get to see exactly how he had been handling his second chance, when he took part in an hour-long interview with Ariel Helwani of MMAfighting.com. This interview was one of the most deep and interesting looks into John's personality and psyche. We get a window into John's community service appearances, where he speaks to children about the poor decisions that almost ruined his life. If you guys are ever faced with a situation where you know you're getting ready to do something that maybe you're not necessarily proud that you're getting ready to do, please do not pull I'll call it a John Bones Jones. Don't do what I did. Think twice. Don't do what I did because right now I am totally regretting what happened that day. Years backwards, I just went. And it hurts. And it really sucks. And if I could save one of you guys from making a dumb decision like I did that day, then this, this me talking to you guys right now is so worth it. John also gives his side of the events that took place on April 26th. Although he doesn't really add much to what we already know, he was adamant that contrary to multiple eyewitness accounts, he did not run back to his vehicle and grab a fat wad of cash. Because he's rich and wouldn't need to. I mean, why would I, why would I need to run, grab some cash? My money's in CDs, investments, and shit like that, you right. know? I could make an argument for why I don't believe his reasoning, but I'll let this one go. More interestingly, John spoke of his initial meeting with Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta and the decision to strip him of his title. According to John, they were going to let him fight Rumble because, at the time, he didn't have a court date and there were no legal barriers preventing him from traveling. However, John didn't want to deal with MMA fans and media asking him about the hit and run during fight week, so he chose not to go ahead with the fight. I told them that I didn't feel as if I could really focus um, on my fight with so much lingering over me. I knew a fight week for me would be hell. I knew the fans were going to give it to me the way I deserved it. And I didn't really, uh, I didn't really have the courage to go through that at the time. So, um, so they told me that you know, you know, we're probably gonna strip you of the title and suspend you indefinitely. I said honestly, I, I could give up. I give a fuck. That's actually what I said. Now this runs directly counter to Dana's statement after John was stripped that John had a lot of chances and this was his last. While John's truthfulness is up for debate, if I had a choice between him and Dana, I know who I'm picking every time. The more telling aspect of this interview, though, was the fact that John seemed to show virtually no remorse for his actions. Even when looking back, he didn't think to express concern for the woman he had injured. I, um, it scared me. It really scared me because um, I started thinking about the fact that I could go to jail for the rest of my life. You know, I didn't know if the baby was going to be fine. I didn't know how far pregnant she was. You know, people said she broke her arm. I was miserable. Mm. I was extremely depressed. You know, I was just thinking about the fact that I could never see my kids again. I was just thinking about, you know, my freedom being taken away. I, I knew I was going to have a long road ahead mm -hmm. of me, you know, financially, legally. 
Instead, he was focused on the consequences it could have had for his legacy and the fact that fans and journalists were kicking him when he was down. I was upset with the backlash I got. You know, reporters that used to praise me, you know, bashing me down. Um, it just hurt. I felt like the whole industry had turned their back on me and uh, I wanted nothing to do with it. Only a few months later, John would say in a Rolling Stone interview that he thought God meant for it to happen so that he could share his story with the world. This is part of his personality that is crucial to understanding why John has been stuck in this vicious cycle we see playing itself out on a regular basis now. He wasn't responsible for it. John doesn't do bad things, bad things happen to him. God is testing him and John is constantly overcoming these tests. So even amidst all of his controversies, John gets to remain a heroic figure in his own mind. John was right about one thing in this interview though. During his conversation with Ariel, they discussed how John's partying and drinking had nearly caused him to lose his fight with Gustafson. I had a lot of fun that camp. I just, in no way, shape, or form, that I feel as if he had what it, take to beat, what it took to beat me. Sure enough, you know, after round two, I was pretty gassed out. That was my first time in my whole career being tired in the second round, and it just went to show. But because of the accident, he was in a unique position. He had essentially been given a golden ticket that few athletes ever receive. This was a second chance in the middle of his prime. The opportunity to come back and prove how great he could really be while sober and without the partying holding him back. The question was, how would he handle it? Chapter 11. Failing Upwards With John reinstated by the UFC and Dana White saying that he would receive an immediate title shot upon his return, the prospect of a rematch with Cormier seemed likely. Indeed, in early February, the rematch was announced for UFC 197. But just two days after the announcement was made, John was involved in even more driving-related legal trouble. As KRQE Local News reported, John had another court date for driving without a license. Online court documents show just last Sunday, Jones was cited for driving without a license, registration, and insurance by a Bernalillo County Sheriff's deputy. This court date was pushed back and John was given an additional three days of community service. John seemed a bit annoyed with the entire issue and made several social media posts complaining about the attention the minor traffic violation was getting. On the other hand, this was a man who less than a year prior nearly had his career derailed by a traffic accident. So you'd think he would be a bit more serious about this shit. For the time being though, the rematch with Cormier was still on and the bad blood between the two had not diminished with John's time away from the sport. While John was in his self-imposed exile, DC had not only won the vacant heavyweight title, but defended it against Alexander Gustafsson in another all-time great light heavyweight fight. What started out looking like it might be a dominant performance by Cormier turned into a grueling dogfight after Gustafsson dropped DC with a knee in the third and nearly finished him. Through sheer toughness, if nothing else, DC weathered the storm and over the next two rounds, edged a split decision victory that saw both men battered, bloody, and exhausted. Following the hard-won fight, DC stated that he needed a break from MMA. So what do you know right now, probably not a lot, but about John Jones's present state and any possible timeline for his return? I have no idea. All I know is that I'm taking a break. I mean, 2015, John... I fought Jones, I fought Rumble Johnson, and I fought Alexander Gustafson. I fought the toughest guys this division has to offer all in 10 months at 36 years old. So I need a little bit of a break. I fought seven times in two years in the UFC. So I'm going to take a little break, man. I think I've earned it. John addressed his comment by tweeting, Take as much time as you want. The fire inside of me won't be dying down anytime soon. To which DC responded, I will take my time. I've been fighting against the best in the world, not dealing with nonsense. Our time is coming. Hashtag grow up. Hashtag you're not a kid. End quote. On October 30th, seemingly apropos of nothing, John tweeted that he'd like to fight Daniel in the OSU wrestling room, and he was just trying to take back what was his. This resulted in DC quote tweeting some fans who were tweeting at him and saying that John would have to beat him every day. John challenged Cormier to come down to Albuquerque, to which DC agreed. Then he posted a photoshopped image of himself in front of the Jackson Wink gym. This specifically seemed to really piss off John for some reason, but it also may have inspired him. The next day, John posted a photoshopped version of the promotional art for UFC 197, 
with Cormier replaced by Carl Winslow. To which DC responded with his own version where John was photoshopped as Tyrone Biggums from Chappelle Show. The beef was perfectly timed, leading into the UFC's unstoppable press conference. Despite being stripped, John brought his belt to the presser. A bit surprisingly, he also received the lion's share of the crowd's adulation, while DC was booed at almost every opportunity. And the reigning, defending, light heavyweight champion of the world, Daniel Cormier! Their verbal sparring produced some genuinely entertaining moments too, like DC calling John out for once again behaving differently backstage than he did in front of the cameras. Guys, for the record, for the record, an hour ago, John called me the lamest, biggest pussy he had ever met in his entire life. So, I mean, believe it. Believe what you want. But this is, he's lying to you guys again. Which led to this incredible argument. Are you the biggest pussy? Am I the biggest pussy you have ever met and you want me to suck your dick like you told me? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Is that what you told me? Is this not real now? Are we pretending? Oh, no. Oh. Are we pretending? Are we no, doing we're, this we're fairy tale shit again? No, you are the biggest pussy I've ever seen, for sure. Okay. Well, that your pussy, that, that you're forever going to be my pussy? That you, and also that I'm forever going to be your pussy. Yeah. Okay, we'll see. DC, visibly frustrated with the reception he was receiving, pointed out that he has always done the things that John was bragging about in the wake of his hit and run, such as being sober. I haven't done all these things. I haven't wrecked my vehicle. I haven't been suspended. I didn't get stripped from my championship. I didn't do all those things. Guys, these are normal things that adult human beings do. You cheer this guy for saying he's not going to do these things anymore. I have done this my entire life, but you boo me. Thank you. Thank you. During the face-off, John crotch chopped DC again, and following the event, it was reported that John and DC's teams were involved in a minor confrontation backstage. Just as the hype for the fight was building, it was put in jeopardy again. On a March 28th episode of the MMA Hour, Jones publicly revealed that he had recently been ticketed again, this time for drag racing as well as four other violations. John's side of the story was that he had been waiting at a red light when some fans said hi to him. John revved his engine in response, which the officer somehow interpreted as drag racing, despite the fact that John didn't speed. John was adamant that the charges were bogus, but admitted to losing his temper with the officer. I get pulled over in a 35 mile per hour zone, and uh, the officer pulls me over and tells me that I was drag racing. And uh, I was obviously really upset, and uh, I asked him how was it possible to be drag racing in a 35 mile per hour zone. And uh, he said, well, I never said you were speedy, but I'm going to tip you for drag racing. Not long after John made this information public in an attempt to get ahead of the media, the Albuquerque Police Department released the body cam footage from John's drag racing citation. Although John was argumentative in the video and called the cop a pig and a fucking liar, among other things, you know, I know that you, you were drag I racing and I will testify know. to that. That I was not drag racing. Actually, you I do know that you were drag racing. Both know that I did not speed. You and I both know that I freaking revved my engine at the red light, and I never took off racing at all. Nor was the car next to me ever took off racing. I just simply revved both my of engine. you took off at a high rate of speed, sir. No, I did Only not. Only you kept going. He no, slowed I down. No, I did not. Okay. You are an absolute fucking liar. Well, we can talk. Oh, can't wait to get out of my face. Despicable. I feel the same way about you, sir. Hey, disgusting. Once again, feelings mutual. The officer also seemed pretty unreasonable, asking John ridiculous questions like, why is your car so loud? Seemingly for no other purpose than to agitate Jones. Is that, why is your is car that, so loud? Why is my, man, you're just harassing me, man. I'm just asking you a simple question, my Jonathan. My car is loud because it's a sports car. Okay, sit tight, I'll be with you in a minute. While I was editing this video, I thought it was important to point out that John called the officer a pig and a liar after he asked John about his car being loud and then gave him five dubious citations. John was given five citations for drag racing, exhibition driving, failing to maintain a traffic lane, failing to properly display his license, and having a loud modified exhaust on his car. John was given a court date in April for the violations and that may have been the end of this incident, if not for the fact that John didn't report it to his parole officer.
On March 29th, John was arrested and spent the next two days in jail. In the end, John caught another lucky break. He was only required to complete driver improvement and anger management courses, as well as 60 additional hours of community service and the condition that John would not drive without first obtaining approval from his probation officer. Though the UFC admitted disappointment in John's most recent run-in with the law, the rematch with Cormier was still on. For one day, literally one day. On, and I'm shitting you not, April 1st, Daniel Cormier pulled out of UFC 197, citing an injury to his interosseous membrane, and was replaced by Ovin St. Prue, in what became a fight for the interim light heavyweight title. John was initially respectful to Cormier, wishing him a healthy recovery. Things changed pretty quickly when DC appeared on the MMA Hour and offered the services of American Kickboxing Academy to OSP for his fight against Jones. We'll open our doors to him. Uh, to come and train at the American Kickboxing Academy. I don't what? care what. We have everything in place where he can just take my training camp for the next few weeks. Take my training camp. OSP politely declined, but John, who was also appearing on the MMA Hour shortly afterward, attacked DC for his behavior, calling him an absolute coward. Daniel is an absolute coward who, who will never beat me. Him inviting OSP to his training camp shows me uh, that he's so grateful that he's not fighting me in three weeks. This accusation really got under the skin of Cormier, who went on a Twitter tirade. Among other things, DC said that Coward is running from the scene of a crime without checking on the person you hurt, he has never been afraid of John who lunches like a bitch, and that John should get off his high horse and stop riding the white horse. John replied with the classic, LOL you mad bro, before questioning if it was DC's time of the month. After bickering about why DC would offer his services to OSP, John asked if Cormier was actually injured or just hurt, to which DC replied that if he were just hurt, he would have kicked John's ass in three weeks. John made some more comments about Cormier's alleged vagina, then said in TJ Dillashaw fashion that he was done talking to Daniel. Was this Twitter beef essential to the story of John Jones? No, but DC going on an uncharacteristic Twitter rant, which he later admitted was fueled by anesthesia, and John replying with childish taunts about periods and pussies was pretty funny to me. With the Cormier beef, at least temporarily, put on the back of Burner, the pre-fight buildup for UFC 197 largely shifted towards John's comeback story. When asked about his legal troubles and a mental state in the aftermath of the hit and run, John's response could be summed up in one word, growth. You know, I, I, feel, I feel alive. I feel uh, as if I've grown a lot. I feel um, as if everything happens for a reason, and we're all on these different journeys and, and different, different paths in life, and, you know, we're all going to, you know, live life differently. So I feel good. I feel happy with who I am today and where I'm at today. I think my fiance's mom um, after one of my fights because she taught me that adversity is the opportunity to grow. And you know, I, I wasn't growing for a while, and, and now I've grown tremendously, so I'm grateful for my show. No, I even thought about retiring for a split second, you know, while I was going through all my, all my drama and, and uh, throughout my darkest days, and you know, then I thought about it, it's like, you know, man, man what a waste of story, what a waste of inspiration and motivation for others, like, you know, it's like God gave us these gifts, man, we gotta use these things. And so, yeah, I, that was easy, I knew he wasn't retired. Earlier when I said that John doesn't believe he's done bad things, he believes bad things happen to him, that was only half true. I don't think John even believes that bad things happen to him. He can't process events that way. In his mind, John is too important for bad things to happen to him, Unless it's the work of haters and spiteful journalists, when something negative occurs in his life, it's an opportunity for him to learn and grow, or it is all part of a grand divine plan that centers around John's story and how he can inspire and motivate others. John often gets called a narcissist, usually for his more grandiose proclamations and delusions, but if you really want to get into the meat and potatoes and nuts of understanding who John is, these are the kind of moments that are the most informing. John thinks that the world revolves around him and that God is personally directing the courts of his life, sprinkling in roadblocks and obstacles when he believes John needs to be humbled a little more. Setting aside the machinations of John's mind for the moment, 
he did have a strange task ahead of him. It would have been generous to call St. Pru anything more than a tune-up fight. He had pieced together a few unremarkable streaks over other 205-pound journeymen, but when this short-notice fight was made, OSP was on a one-fight win streak, and his most significant win was probably a knockout of an aging Shogun Hua, who had been TKO'd by Dan Henderson in his previous fight. Although John stated that he was not overlooking St. Pru, no one was giving OSP much of a chance of winning this fight, and he didn't pull out any surprises. Well, except for the fact that he went the distance with Jones, who seemed content to spend most of the fight pot-shotting OSP from just out of range. Other than a few flurries in the clinch and some ground and pound in the fourth round, it was a pretty uneventful fight where John never stepped on the gas. That decision only becomes more curious when it was revealed that St. Prue had been fighting with a broken arm from the second round. Now, it's hard to criticize a dominant win, but in context, John couldn't finish a guy who had never been in the contender fight, let alone fought for a championship. Who took the fight on three weeks' notice and had a broken arm for about 19 minutes of the fight? To be fair to John, he was probably just a bit rusty and had an off night. But that is one thing that separates John from other fighters. He's not just supremely talented or extremely skilled, he's also been incredibly lucky. He's lucky that DC pulled out of UFC 197 and essentially gave Jones a tune up fight against St. Pru. The margin between winning and losing a fight can be as small as one fighter being in great shape while the other is having an off night. John was lucky that he happened to have his off night performance against a journeyman with a broken arm instead of the second best guy in the division. Otherwise, things could have gone much differently, but they didn't. John won the interim title, and within a short time, a unification bout with Cormier was scheduled for UFC 200. Chapter 12. Small Dick Energy the promotional apparatus for UFC 200 went into motion almost immediately, as in literally minutes after the fight. While John was leaving the cage, he paused and gave Cormier the middle finger. As if to leave zero doubt about his motivations, John said at the post-fight press conference that he flipped DC off specifically to build hype for their rematch. Um, and so I just wanted to give him the finger just to, just, <laughs> just to, just to keep it going, just to, you know, get under his skin and, and keep the fans excited. Of course, since this is John and DC we're talking about, there was some more childish quarreling on social media, specifically Cormier slapping a custom John Jones heavy bag on his Instagram account, which led John to clap back at DC with a blog post that I'm going to read in its entirety because it's somewhere between a Shadow the Hedgehog meme and that weird Jordan Peterson video where he threatened the woke left. Quote, it's good to see you enjoying your last days as paper champ, Daniel. I was actually planning on leaving you alone and letting you enjoy them with your family. Then you had to go and put this weird shit on the internet. It's obvious I'm balls deep in your head right now, but you can pause with all that groping there, pussy boy. You'll be getting your ass kicked soon enough. Just really hoping these aren't your tactics for UFC 200. See you soon, buddy. Train smart. Don't need you pulling out again. The actual light heavyweight champion. End quote. Aside from the minor back and forth, the buildup for UFC 200 had little of the social media beefing we've grown accustomed to from this pair. Instead, we got a deeper look at the dynamic of their relationship. The Counterpunch interview in particular is notable for being one of the most compelling explorations of their rivalry, with both men providing ready insight into the other's flaws and insecurities. John delivered an extremely cutting breakdown of Daniel's mentality, and why he will never beat him as a result. At the end of the day, I'm the only guy to beat him. You can blame it on being nervous, or I had never fought on that stage, or I had never fought for five rounds, whatever excuse you want to come up with for why you lost the first time. The truth of the matter is, I am the alpha, and, and that's why uh, there's a hatred there. The hatred comes from him. It stemmed from him from the very beginning. Whereas Cormier tore into John as a person by proffering what is still to this day the most accurate description of John's cycle of perpetual fuck-ups. His history dictates and determines that the same thing's gonna happen. That is his character, that is him at his core. You don't constantly make mistakes. You make mistakes, but you don't do them over and over no. and over and over. No. no, says who? This interview is probably the best example of why the feud between Jones and Cormier is one of the greatest we've ever seen. They play off each other so well, and each possesses an insight into the other's mindset, which created many incredibly intense moments over the years. I will die to beat you. Know that. Be prepared to do that. 
With that in mind, this was the third time these men had been through the promotional machine against each other, and they both seemed a bit tired for it. Jones admitted that his hatred for DC was waning over time, and DC stated that he was done playing games with John outside the cage. This is a game, you know, like to him it's a game. This is no game to me. I'm not here to, to talk and, and jibber and jabber and argue like we've been doing before. I'm here to kick his ass on Saturday. So I'd rather show him than tell him again. I'm done. I'm done with all the talking and jibber and jabbering. I'm ready to fight. Well, DC, I have some bad news for you. The UFC organization was notified tonight that the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency has informed John Jones of a potential anti-doping policy violation stemming from an out-of-competition sample collection on June 16th, 2016. On July 6th, three days before UFC 200, John Jones was pulled from the card due to a violation of the USADA testing policy. The UFC's partnership with the United States Anti-Doping Agency had been introduced a year prior in what was presented as a game-changing effort to clean up the sport with year-round random PED testing. There had already been fights lost and suspensions handed out because of USADA. But this was the worst case scenario. The main event of what the UFC was hyping up as their biggest event ever had just been pulled from the card. No one was hit harder by the news than Daniel Cormier, who went so far as to ask if he could sign a waiver to fight John regardless of his status. It's easy to see why he was willing to take such a huge risk. As John pointed out several times, Cormier needed this fight to legitimize himself as the real champ in the eyes of the fans. Me losing to OSP should be the last thing that he would want. Because if I were to somehow lose, that means he doesn't get to revenge his only loss. You know, after I won this second fight, you know, he's over. He's in a position where, you know, he loses this one. You know, he never really was the champion. I think he knows that. I'm in the fact that he lost to me once already, that, you know, another loss by me just would, it would really uh, do some devastation to his legacy. And for the second time in three months, the opportunity was taken away from him when the finish line was with insight. I'm gonna need a little bit of time. This one stings. You know, this is not, this is not easy to deal with. I've, I've, my life has revolved around this for a long time. So this one stings. This one stings a little bit. The next day, John Jones held a press conference of his own, accompanied by his manager, Malki Kawa, and his crisis PR agent, Denise White. Jones attempted to address the USADA violation. Though they didn't talk about the specific details, John professed his innocence and apologized to everyone for the upheaval caused by the violation. I want to first uh, start by apologizing to, to. Um all the fans, all the fans who came out to support me for UFC 200. Um, obviously, the UFC, um, and Daniel Cormier. I want to apologize to Daniel Cormier. I know that uh, this fight means a lot to him. Whatever you think of John, there is something on a human level that is difficult about watching him struggle to be optimistic in the moment, to be at a loss for words and start crying when it seems like the gravity of the situation finally dawned on him. Realizing he might be out of the sport for two years in his prime, perhaps even more painfully, his legacy was in jeopardy. I talked to Lorenzo Fertitta. I told him that uh, I told him that I would never cheat. That's, I pride myself in my work ethic. But I wouldn't take anything that, that would um, Enhance my game, like to like it. I wouldn't cheat. That's just not who I am. All that John could do was reconcile with himself that this must be another test from God, that some good must be coming from it. I believe that that uh, something really, something really good is going to happen, and maybe if I'm out for two years, maybe this is, you know, something that that God felt that I needed uh, for my development as a person. In the coming days and weeks, the MMA community was forced to play the waiting game as a trickle of updates slowly emerged. On July 8th, John's B sample was confirmed to contain the same banned substance as his A sample. Three days later, during an appearance on the Joe Rogan Experience, Chael Sonnen stated that John had tested positive for two estrogen blockers. In the same episode, Chael made the claim that this was not John's first run-in with USADA either, 
In a now legendary story, Chael accused John of avoiding USADA agents by hiding under the cage at Jackson Wink MMA. According to Sonnen, USADA was of the opinion that at some point over an 8 hour period where they believed John was under the cage, he must have had to urinate. So they wanted to get a warrant to look under the cage and test the theoretical piss. For a long time, this story was just a part of MMA lore, like many of Chael's stories, until John confirmed it himself during an argument with Israel Adesanya. At least according to John, he was not hiding from USADA, but the Athletic Commission, because he had smoked a blunt and didn't want to fail a test for marijuana. At any rate, Mystic Chael's claim about estrogen blockers turned out to be true, when a week later the NSAC revealed that John had tested positive for hydroxychlomaphene and letrozole. Clomiphene, or Clomid, is a selective estrogen receptor modulator that is most commonly prescribed for women with infertility issues, but it is sometimes prescribed off-label to men for the treatment of hypogonadism and low testosterone. For those reasons, it is frequently used as a part of post-cycle therapy to help return hormone levels to normal after using performance enhancers. Letrozole is a powerful aromatase inhibitor used in the treatment of breast cancer, among other things. In simple terms, letrozole prevents testosterone from being converted into estrogen. It should be easy to see why both of these substances would be appealing to somebody using PEDs to get their hormone levels back in check after a cycle. Once it was revealed that John had popped for clomiphene and letrozole, the Nevada Athletic Commission put him on a temporary suspension. Later that day, Jones tried to plead his innocence on Twitter by claiming that he was only a victim of his own ignorance. While arguing with some fans, he stated that he wasn't in the same boat as Brock Lesnar, who had also tested positive after UFC 200. About that. Brock popped for clomiphene too. <laughs> I guess you're gonna need a bigger boat, John. One with enough room for a jacked white boy. It would take four months for John to get his hearing with USADA, but in November, the case went into arbitration and a decision was reached. As it turned out, there was some truth to early rumors that John had taken a boner pill and that was the source of the violation. The story, at least as John's legal team presented it, was that on or about the date of June 14th, 2016, he was having dinner with his training partner Eric Blazich. For some bizarre reason, Blazich mentioned that he had been taking Cialis. John, who had been taking Viagra and thought they were similar products, asked Blazich to go out to his car and get him one which John then took with no questions asked. Unfortunately for John, it wasn't Cialis. The tablet he had taken was a generic Tadalafil tablet that Blazich had purchased online from a website called All-American Peptide. Doesn't that sound legitimate? John's manager provided USADA with a packet of these tablets from Blazich for testing purposes, and USADA independently purchased their own samples for comparison. When tested, all samples of the Tadalafil tablets from All-American Peptide tested positive for clomiphene, letrozole, and a third estrogen blocker, tamoxifen. Well, there you go. Open and shut case, right? Not exactly. But there were some problems with John's story. First, Blazich had provided an invoice for the Tadalafil tablets, which he claimed had been delivered to his home in New York before he drove out to Albuquerque to train with John. The problem was that the invoice was dated May 25th of 2016, which was after he claimed to have left New York. Furthermore, the invoice for the purchase included an order for clomiphene itself, alongside the Tadalafil tablets. This was something that had not been accounted for in their oral statements regarding the issue. Side note, but in John's explanation of events, he claimed that he hit upon the Tadalafil as a potential source of the violation when he gratuitously told an employee at a local Max Muscle outlet that he had taken a sex pill, and she immediately identified that as the explanation. Just picture that scenario unfolding in your mind for a minute. Also worth noting, the packaging for the Tadalafil tablet John took was labeled, This product is for chemical research use only, not intended for human consumption slash use. Warning, if product is ingested, contact poison control. One more side note. The company that John's friend bought the Tadalafil tablets from, All-American Peptide, was actually shut down after the couple who operated it were arrested and charged with illegally selling mislabeled pharmaceuticals, as well as other performance-enhancing compounds like SARMs. This evidence was sufficient enough for the arbitration panel to come to the judgment that although the Tadalafil tablet could be identified as the source of the substance that triggered the USADA violation, 
John's behavior was so reckless that it couldn't be considered consumption of a tainted product. So, unlike Tim Means or Yoel Romero, he didn't meet the criteria for a reduced sentence on that basis. Because clomiphene and letrozole are considered specified substances by WADA and the UFC's USADA testing policy, John's suspension was reduced from a potential two years down to one, retroactive to the date of June 16th. In a similar fashion, the Nevada State Athletic Commission also suspended John for a year. Following the decision, John was stripped of his interim light heavyweight title, making him not only the first UFC fighter to be stripped of an interim title, but the first and still only fighter to be stripped of a title twice. Despite being stripped and suspended, John took the decision to mean that he had cleared his name and proven that he wasn't a cheater who had intentionally taken any prohibited substances. In December, John appeared on the Joe Rogan Experience, where he gave a slightly different account of the events that led to his USADA violation. To start, John claimed that he had taken the dick pill because he has such a huge cock that he needs the proverbial twist at the end of the punch you get from male enhancement. Huge might be a bit relative, though. Anybody's dick will look huge if their balls have been shriveled by steroids, a point once eloquently made by Rich Piana. Of course you would rather see a dick hang lower than the balls. Now, More importantly, John also changed his story about where he got the dick pill from, saying that he got it from a friend whose girlfriend was a pharmacist. It's hard to know why John changed his story during this interview. Maybe he thought it made him look more like an innocent victim of deception and bad luck. Maybe he's a compulsive liar. Maybe it was just an honest mistake. Regardless, it doesn't really change anything. The most charitable perspective you can take on this incident is that John was reckless to a truly bewildering degree. He's a tested athlete who decided to take a random pill from a friend with no questions asked. It's an explanation so profoundly stupid that it beggars belief. A less charitable look at the situation would take into account the fact that John is somebody who already had suspicious test results in the past. Then he popped for multiple estrogen blockers, which he claimed he accidentally ingested in a dick pill that came from a website that got shut down for illegally selling PEDs, including one of the substances John pissed hot for. At best, it's very shady. We will probably never know exactly what happened. Whether John was a victim of his own recklessness, or if he intentionally took prohibited substances. The bigger issue was that John had once again missed a huge fight, and he was forced to sit on the sidelines for another year while the light heavyweight division moved on without him. As part of the overall story of John Jones, 2015 and 2016 represent a moment of transition in his life and career. Before this time, John had minor controversies about debatable transgressions like having a contrived public persona. But during this period, we see his career become plagued by legal problems, repeated arrests, drug test failures, and long periods away from the sport. All elements that have come to epitomize the career of John Jones that we're familiar with today. In the coming years, it would only get worse. As always, I want to thank you for watching the video, as well as liking, commenting, and subscribing. And a special thank you to my supporters on Patreon, who help make these videos possible. Thank you. Who really cares? Question mark. Iron Shamrock. Jokes in my pants. Fight back. CVD. Ryan Cedor. Mike Robals. Dot Old Neon. Timothy Lee Peterson. Julius Caesar has jungle fever. Tracksuit. Red at 78. Sviat. Jackson. Firebrand, Jack Trey Bowles, Snepsts, I Said No Cops, Paulo Gomez, Alex, Kyle, Hassan Jokai, Tambi Helmick, Neem, and Kevin Howard.